I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Wait, 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 wait. Who is that? I'm not sure who. I hadn't seen him in so long. Anybody <laughs> that can take off for two weeks and go to Alaska. Yeah, and never hear anything from him. Don't know he's leaving. Don't know he's coming No, back. he's just gone. I emailed him three days in a row about something, and, I, and he Man, didn't answer. And I'm like, nothing, where is Dave? Nothing. I just want to go on record right now and say that is completely false. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't just disappear? No. Who did you tell? Uh, I think everybody knew I was going to Alaska. I, I, maybe three maybe months he, ago. I, <laughs> I can't I remember think, what happened last week. I think they're turning on you because they're jealous. Yeah, uh, I think absolutely. they're turning on me. Jealousy yeah. is I a mean, that is big exactly bang. what is fueling my conversation. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're here unloading trucks, yeah. loading trucks. He's and eloping to Alaska. I'm going to or maybe, see, a, can, maybe elope is the wrong word. Well, he took his girlfriend. Oh, he did take his girlfriend. So he is definitely vying for... Most interesting gamekeeper of the year. Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. yeah well. well, proud to have you back, David. Glad to be back. We missed you. What'd you catch? I caught a few fish. Caught a lot of Dolly Varden. Um, Dolly Parton. Dolly Pardons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Wow. Dolly Varden. Do you have have you caught one of those, Bobby? No, I haven't. Oh, you're mad. I can tell. Look at that. <laughs> you see that? Did you catch any what salmon? No, no. Yep. Uh, Did you bring us any back? I didn't. I didn't keep any. To be honest with you. Mm. Um, no, but wow. the dolly were kind of my, my goal. Like that what is my, a dolly? My, that was kind of my dream fish. What about cutthroat? Yeah, yeah they're, a, cutthroat? A, they're a char, actually. Right. Um, but yep. they're like, uh, it's kind of similar to a bull trout, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, a, a dolly varden. It's kind of cool how they get I read about there. them in Outdoor Life once upon a time. They've got a crazy just, fin on the top lights? of them, right? The, the, the fin on the top of them is kind of elongated looking? Uh, no, that's a grayling you're talking about. Yeah, okay. you're thinking yeah. of they See, don't get very big. We're I, so I, far I removed from those <laughs> cool places that we, we what don't river, know. What river were you fishing? Uh, uh, mm. uh, uh, he ain't going to tell us. This was a like pretty a, small yeah, river. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you had to look at his own. A head. creek? We, we, yeah, in a creek. <laughs> yeah. we'll south, get, uh, south Alaska. We'll call somebody south from Old Axe to look it up. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just we'll just hack into it. Well, we're not doing a fishing podcast, so we're no, we're not. Yeah, no, well, that's uh, well, David, we're, it's good Glad that you you're back. back. We've got a lot of things for you to be doing now. Yeah, uh, that you're back. This so. has been stacked. Well, up. just remember in the future, <laughs> if you go to Alaska, come back with the bullseye shirt on because yeah. you're going to get <laughs> incoming. Yeah. Well, Part you of. know, speaking of catching fish, Jess Rayleigh caught a tarpon a he few sure days did. ago. He sure did. Yep. Yeah, in Mississippi. Yep. Which yeah. is pretty crap, right yep. off Cat Island. So. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty cool. It's a big one, too. Yeah, it looked yeah. big to me. That's no easy feat. That's the biggest a, looking men I've ever seen It's in my a life. cool yeah. fishery that's been flying under the radar for a long mm -hmm. time. And they're not really far offshore catching them. So yeah. No. Pretty well, they, come, they migrate through they're the late, last part of late the Late summer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they're, they're cool fish, for sure. Um, I've seen some velvet deer in yep. South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, our very own Jason Douglas. Yeah, I hadn't seen that. Arrowed a beautiful buck. What? Oh, People are yeah. deer hunting? Yeah. It does seem early, doesn't I'm it? I'm not here whacking borders of seed back here, and Jason uh, Douglas is whacking uh, One of my best friend's daughter, uh, back Rivers back. Middleton, killed a beautiful velvet deer in South Carolina. Wow. August 15th, rifle season and everything traditionally opens up in the low country of South Carolina. Hmm. Bob Dixon and I and Cuz made a trick of trip, trek over there once upon a time, and... To this day, in 62 years, that was the worst mosquito <laughs> infestation. I mean, you literally had to have a full head net on to mm, breathe. Didn't you have it was a, no fun. Didn't you have a bow blow up it at did. full draw? Yep. I bet that was exciting. It sounded like a rifle shot going off. Pow! Mm. It snapped. They can hurt you, too. Yeah, yeah, but it didn't. It just melted. What brand bow was uh, that? You know, they're out of business now, but it was, a, yeah. it was actually an Oregon bow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the we first carbon bow. That's right. But uh, to my fault, I left it in the back of my pickup for the summer, and 140 degrees is not good for a bow. So <laughs> well, I, that doesn't surprise that, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you live and learn. I don't anymore. Yeah. I bet you didn't even know that. I bet you left. No, your I knew that. Yeah, I actually knew that. Man, those Oregon bows that brings back like a blast from the past. They were past. had those recurve limbs on. Mm -hmm. That's what this was—a 48-inch yeah. axle to axle. Yeah. It's like yeah. a finger shooter's bow. Shooting a 165 gram broadhead or something. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Simmons interceptor. Yeah. 25 oh, back in the day <laughs> that, that was With a great broadhead 
Yep. So sitting at the end of the table on the get the guest chair he, is one of our. He's not even a guest anymore. Well, he's no, like, he, I mean, it, he's, he just, yeah, he's one of the member. guys because he can fire bullets just y'all like y'all can. He so. shows yeah, up. Can. Yeah, but, but Doctor Bronson Strickland from Mississippi State, and somewhere we have some horns that they're. There he is. He's still in Alaska. <laughs> You said, full, velvet, you said velvet buck and his eyes yeah, glazed yeah. over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Bronson, we're excited to have you here. Thank you very much. And, Appreciate uh, the invite. So we're, we're going to, a little bit later on, we're, we're going to start asking you some questions. And oh, boy. Talk about fall food plots and come at it from the angle of what are the deer needing and wanting in the fall and the winter. For, okay. for you being a, a deer biologist, the lead guy in the state of Mississippi, uh, the head honcho. You are the guy. Uh, I wouldn't Mr. Go that Whitetail. Far. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go that far either. <laughs> well, now, Charlie, this is a great the, topic. Bobby, between you that. and Damaris and all that crowd over there, yeah, y'all good, are. We got a good group. Yeah, y'all do. It's awesome. A great group. Yeah. One thing on this topic I, is the more I think I may have possibly figured it out, the more I find out I'm wrong. Oh, so yeah. it never yeah. it never ceases to evolve. It's a fascinating topic. Yeah, it's it really is. And I think it's you know just keeping everybody's awareness of their own place, their own geography. The only you know what are what are deer missing in their area. You know, plus what you plant and how you plant it and all that. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, it it sure is. Well, so that's what we're gonna do. But before we take this uh, this deep dive into talking about food plots. I want to mention our sponsor this week, and it's uh, Apex Munitions over in Columbus, Mississippi. Some They're great guys. our friends over there. They really kind of specialize in those turkey shells that we all love to shoot. <laughs> but they have some well. waterfowl loads, I and I think if you want some, you probably better go ahead and get them. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Everybody's stocking up. Are they making anything for Dove? I think they do. Now, wouldn't that be a lot of fun? Man, they're working I, I on, shoot too much Dove. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> they're always working on something that they may not be telling you about, but they're so they say the average guy shoots seven times to kill a dove. Do you, a where, dove? A dove. Seven shots for every dove. Bronson, where do you think you fall in that? More? Oh, at lower? least two to three. Yeah. Not two to three times. I'm saying two to three shots. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's really good. Yeah. I, I'm kidding with you. It's <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go 10 to 15. Yeah, yeah, I thought you were going to say two or three times seven shots. That, that's probably I've seen safe. plenty of that, yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, it, it's, how, it's humbling how uh, uh, being on a dove shooting, they're flying fast, and how you can, until you kind of get a rhythm, sometimes yeah. they can humble you. Yeah, that's exactly. It's kind of, uh, I'm kind of all or nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same I'm way. good or real bad. I'm re- good, I'm really good, and when I'm bad, I'm horrid. Me too. <laughs> Remember that? Like the old fable. <laughs> is there a mindset that you f- have figured out that, that uh, no. is, there, is there a mental game to Don't it? Don't think about it. I, that's yeah. exactly, that's the mental part is to not think about it. Man, the, you, the second I start thinking about it. Yeah. If you start calculating, man, he's coming about this far. And no, I'm be this far yeah. in front of him. No. no. Uh, the old adage of start behind them, pull through their tail when you get through their head. Yes. Yeah. Keep the gun barrel moving. Yeah, keep it moving. Yeah. That's yep. it. That's, yeah, that's the key good. To it. That's Don't good overthink. advice. Yeah. Don't overthink. Yep. Well, good. Well, that's so. What are you, where are you? I mean, I'm, you're. You he's pretty you're, consistent. He's pretty consistent. I want to know how he rates himself. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. One out of two. No, I'm not. No, One not, out of three. I'd say for somebody that doesn't practice all the time, you're. Really good. I'm like Toxie said. I'm either on or I'm off. Mm-hmm. I've seen him both. Me too. Yeah. And when you're off, it is just, just like yeah. hurts your feelings. <laughs> it, it really Remember does. when we went well, whale start, hunting that time and I didn't hit thinking. anything? Yeah, you start, you start thinking you're I start done. Doing calculus. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do. Bronson. When I look at you, I, it just, I, 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 just, I just smile because we've got you, – you've come over here so many times. We've had so many interesting discussions, but we learn so much every time you're sitting right there. And now I've listened – you're on a lot of podcasts. You've become like a superhero in the deer hunting industry for all the knowledge. In the Mississippi State Deer Lab, you guys have just got a, getting a lot of respect out now, there. he was our first guest. Was he not? Yes, he was. Oh, we talked right. about antler yeah. genesis. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, well, th- I, just yeah. wanted, I wanted to congratulate you well, because... Th- th- thank you very much. I'm really, really lucky, and uh, again, that's, that's part of my job is I have an outreach appointment, so uh, going on podcasts and doing that kind of thing is, is what I'm supposed to do, so mm. it, it, it's a win-win. So it's in the next time we won't ask you, we're just going to tell you. You can demand that okay. I come. All yeah. right. <laughs> Careful. Yeah. I love how he likes to be there quietly watching us make fools of ourselves. Yes. He's gotten to enjoy that a lot, I think. Yes. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I would like to say a blatant yeah. 
arrogant plug for my great alma mater is that yes we have been a great deer white tail deer university for a very long day back to i can remember the days of dr harry yes and it was top of the food chain right there with anywhere and today better than ever it's not something that's just happened lately we have a great heritage there at mississippi state and something i'm very proud of my dad went to whitetail school like as a consumer there in the in the seventies, I think, and eighties when y'all mm-hmm. were teaching classes. Mm-hmm. That would have been Harry. Yeah, would have been teaching you know, that class. Is that I Harry the child Jacobson? Jacobson. Is that his name? Mm-hmm. I, I was like, why can't I go? And he's like, you're not old. Like, oh. Coincidentally, Toxie, <laughs> we are having a conversation on, on our podcast, the Deer University. Right. We are talking to Harry tomorrow. Oh, wow, awesome! And I'm tuning so into that one. Yeah, we're going to line it up, yeah. and we we've already kind of got a little bit of an outline. You yeah. know, we want it to be. Conversation. He really, he really, truly is a pioneer in yeah, that a- absolutely. world. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell him that Dr. said hello. I will. I certainly will. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, not I will. I'll, please do. <laughs> <laughs> out of body. Yeah, we got him. Yeah, we got him all twitter painted over there. Yeah. Twitter so, painted. All right. So look, first thing, Richie. Let's start this one. Let's. We're going to call Oscar Ruiz, who who is a soil expert, and let's talk about uh, just real quick, real brief. We won't keep him a long time, but talk about soil tests, how much dirt they need, and what they test for, and then we'll go into food plots. And this is the engine behind our soil testing service. Yes, too. that is exactly right. So uh, let's. Uh, Richie, can you see if you can get him now? Hello, gentlemen. How you doing? <laughs> hey, Oscar. Uh, we are so glad to have you. Look, this is Bobby Cole. We got Dudley, Lanny, Toxie, and Dr. Bronson Strickland, but you don't have to call him doctor. But we are so proud. Look, uh, Oscar, you've been around through the Biologic Labs and the Waypoint Soil Testing Service. Uh, you've been helping us for a number of years. Oh, probably 20 years we've been working with you guys. Yeah, and- yeah. I, I started here in in 2008, and you guys have been working with, with – um, uh, us formerly A and L at Labs and now Waypoint Analytical since 2002. Yeah, you know I, I think found every, that out from Chris Langford. 20 year anniversary. Yeah. So look, I, Oscar, I want to hit the horns for you, please. Here, here we go. We're we're excited to have you, Oscar. <laughs> First thing, you know, Dudley uh, has prior to this podcast, he made a point. We so many people do these soil tests. But they'll end up calling us and going, hey, I, I hadn't gotten my results. And nine times out of ten, it's people don't write their email address on there. Legibly. Where you, can, where you guys can read it. But That's, yeah, that's, that's all, correct. All our, our biggest pet peeve over here is legibility. <laughs> um, you go through our entire process, and it's pretty tight. Um, I think you guys have been through here. You guys see our process is, is pretty much set in stone if, if, if there is any issues on the reception side, it typically is due to missing information, uh, legibility, um, or or somebody's filters are hyperactive. Yep. Yeah. Or all the above. So, look, yes, Oscar, sir. let's start here. Um, we, we talk all the time about how important a soil test is, but would you tell our listeners how much dirt you need to get and then kind of walk us through that stage just real quick. We don't want to take a lot of your time, but what happens once you get the dirt and then uh, it, just how that whole process works? Well, it's essential first that the client be mindful of what a, what an appropriate uh, soil sample is. And that involves, you know, taking uh, a, a samples from different points in the field, making, making sure you mix them up uh, very well, and making sure that the total amount of soil that you submit to us for analysis is no less than two cups. Okay? Two, two cups two of soil. Cup. Okay. No, not less than two cups. Not less than two cups of soil. Which is, means more than two cups. Yeah, it does mean more than that. <laughs> yeah. There you go, Bobby. I put it, put it more than way. I was a thinking pint, it was. A yeah. pint of beer. There you a go. pint of beer. Perfect. Did he say beer? Yeah, beer. beer. Okay. All right. Well, that yeah, our listeners ought to know what that is. That's right. Exactly. Think of it as a quart Ziploc. Half of that quart Ziploc is two cups. Mm -hmm. Well, I would probably say just fill it up all the way because if you tell somebody half of a quart, it could be a a sliver of of soil filling up that that um, that bag. And it's the same piece of soil. I mean, it'll go up halfway up the bag when it's flat on right. the table. So uh, the, the two cups, I think, is the key. Gotcha. 
And you're saying to be sure and agitate it and mix it up really good yourself and don't depend on the lab to do it for you. Yeah, um, because oftentimes what a person will do is he'll go to different points in a certain field, put those in a bucket, mix them up, and it'll be it'll be ex, it'll be in excess of two cups. Okay, it'll be excess of two cups. So mix them up real well there in that bucket, and then take the two cups from that bucket and put it in the bag. Yeah, and I would you think you, that yeah, way you get a good average of the of the whole field. Right, and I would think you would correct incent people to be sure and clean that bucket really, really good. It doesn't have a foreign matter in there that taints the sample because I've had you know, remnant fertilizer yeah, or it, feed or something in my, you know, working in the garden, it, other soil and stuff in there, and, and it, it kind of stains it. I, I would think you'd want to really get a clean yeah. bucket. Yeah. If it's in a bucket of bolts, if there's a bucket of bolts and you just dump them to go get your soil, it's not going to work. That's you're right. going to get – you're going to get – um skewed results yep. yeah so what happens after the soil arrives at the lab well when we get the when we get the the sample we open that box up make sure that we have a, a an information sheet or that sheet that gives us the, tells us the, the the person's name address email telephone number um what test he wants what uh what products are listed and um, and then we make sure that the samples are properly identified, and then we put them in line. We put those soils in line. Um, once they get in line, they get dried, then they get pulverized, and then they get uh, go through a, a chemical extraction process, and then a and then a, a, a measuring process where we're determining the acidity of the soil. That is the pH. Okay, and the different nutrients that are either low, adequate, or high in the soil. Based on that information, we, we well using we, we print that information on a report, and we also um, we also based on that information provide the, the the client a recommendation for lime if the soil is acidic, or uh, nitrogen if a product is not a, a high in legumes or clovers or alfalfa um, phosphorus if it's if he's low in, or or medium in, in phosphorus and the same for potassium and magnesium okay so it's a great tool to to get an idea of how much you're gonna have to budget to make your soil fertile and productive so you get the biggest bang for your buck but for that product that you're trying to establish um and they they do it very efficiently uh, usually within a day of of it's them late. receiving it's, it's the soil uh, that's so right you get a report right. and it's it's very that's user right. friendly uh they usually give uh three recommendations of uh more readily available uh, fertilizer ratios. So if you take mm -hmm. it to the co-op, you can just hand them the sheet and they will give you the proper mix. It uh, makes it pretty easy. Yep, it very makes it easy. Pretty easy yeah. And if they don't have yes, 3300, they may have 4600. And right. the, those right. sheets will give examples of, of three different products that you can that you can That's use right. to get the same result and and you'll give them you'll also give them the if there's certain very essential but trace elements needed it'll list that too yep. yeah that's yeah. true yeah we could do that we could do that um and the thing is this sometimes you run i get i get some of some questions sometimes you, do, you guys do a great job of answering a lot of the questions but if if, if the client were to get a little more um inquisitive or curious about other things or, or, or doubts, have doubts about some some type of fertilizer, how to prepare this oil, they they they, they can call us as well. We have we can talk to, to, to them and and tell them how best to handle the their, their soil fertility. So that's that's part of the service. Yeah. So uh, Bronson looks like you've got a question. I, I do real quick. Other than um, phosphorus and potassium what mineral is most often limited in your soil test from the southeast? 
that we typically test for. Yeah, like often boron or manganese or maybe something like that. Is there one that shows up most frequently? Well, I could say that. That depends on the region, okay? Um, a lot of your sandier soils will be deficient in, um, in magnesium and sulfur and boron, okay? And they can tend to be acidic, okay? Now you get into your clay, clayier areas and it'll be more a lot of potassium sometimes, potassium deficiencies, sulfur deficiencies. Um, but almost always, always, you'll have to be, you're going to be low in nitrogen. So that's why most all your soil tests, all your soil reports are going to make a recommendation for nitrogen. Okay. And, and that'll show on products that have um, little to no legumes. Good stuff. Yeah. Very. I tell you, every time I've ever dealt with them, Oscar is, they're just, they're great folks. Oscar is super dependable. If you if you send a question up there, you're going to get a good answer back. So uh, people Thank that you, you they, Thank you. they can go to, uh, they can go to our website, Lanny, uh, plantbiologic.com. And there's a little icon. I think it's uh, when you drop down, when you get down in the, somewhere in there, it says soil food test. Food plot soil test. That, you that, just that, Google that, food plot soil so, test and you'll get right there to it. As a segue to where we're headed with Bronson, I would, uh, submit that mm, probably 15 years, but I ran soil tests and consistently on one property, and it was a heavy clay prairie property, um, manganese, as he mentioned, was deficient. Magnesium, slightly, but def really deficient, like a red flag almost. And so all but one of the plots we planted, I, they actually had the supplements at the co-op to dump in the buggy with it. Mm. And unbelievable the Change difference the yeah and i mean it could have been just the one that i didn't have you know i came back and planted later something was different about it but it was so evident the difference when those plants got that even though it was a trace element mm. yeah. so you know and mm -hmm. so my segue mm -hmm. is that i believe i'm not asking not telling bronson is like the the better healthier the more all of that nutrition the plant has the more the deer are going to crave it and the more you're going to attract stuff i would think mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, yeah, and I guess to that end, the, the more nutrients that are available that the plants need, the better they're going to grow. Right. And the more they grow and the more healthier they are, the more tissue that's being developed, the more palatable it's, it's going to be. So, yeah, deer are going to seek it out because it's a, it's a healthy plant, not a stressed plant. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know we repeat this over and over. I can't tell you how many times we get phone calls of, well, my my field's doing this or it's doing that. And I say, have you had a soil test? And they're like, well, yeah. well, no. Yeah. So unless you get a soil test result back, you're throwing darts. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, sure. and you're, you're spending Blind a lot of money. It. Blind well, uh, the, hey, that's a good point. As of this year, the point too, is you may be wasting money. Mm -hmm. If you're not, mm -hmm. if you're not hitting towards the soil analysis, uh, cause the cost of fertilizer is crazy. Oh you, yeah. You may be wasting. There's so many, if you look up, there's so much literature. It's like I just planted some cheap ones. You're looking up, and you always say the standard thing, you know, you know, whatever, so 250 pounds of triple 17, blah, blah, blah. And they don't know. They shouldn't even put that in the, you know, the planting reg book or guide. Uh, you know, they should say fertilize the soil test. Yeah. You know, a if, soil if, test. We, if somebody tells you guys and gals what they're going to plant, whether it be chufas or beans or clover or cereal grains or even tomato plants you can give them the prescription for that soil needs right yeah yep and yep, I mean, a plant <laughs> is a nutrient <laughs> transfer agent right yeah I mean, yeah, you know, it's yeah. Getting from the ground to, to the to that's that. common Absolutely. sense yep you gotta have it you, so, you guys you guys don't know often I, I get calls often from um food plotters hmm that they have questions about their about their soil test and they they're they they've thanked me for like golly thanks i mean that means i don't have to spend as much they they had budgeted yeah. for for a lot to spend a lot more money than what they had to that they, what they ended up having to apply i yeah, mean can, it could go can. the other way as well it could go the other way you might sure. have to end up spending more but at least you're going to get it right Right. Helps with expectations. Well, you could create a toxicity in your soil, can't you, Dudley? If you I, put too much. I, you know, when I first started testing at my farm, uh, 
probably 15 years ago, uh, we had phosphorus levels that were through the roof. And the last from, thing you needed was more from phosphorus. people repeatedly nope. putting out triple 13 or whatever. Right. And, uh, you know, phosphorus doesn't move through the soil very quickly at all. And it just, you know, it builds up. Um, it's not like nitrogen that kind of melts its way down through the soil right. column quickly. Very quick. So the best thing about what Oscar does, <clears throat> if you do one of these soil tests, you can tell them exactly what you're wanting to plant, whether right. it's non-typical mm -hmm. clover mm -hmm. Or, or it's a, yeah, or a, some something with cereal, mm, cereal, cereal it, and they'll put they'll customize the soil test for you and for that planting, and so you could customize each food plot depending on what you want to plant. It's a great service, and Oscar, you guys, it's do actually a, the cheapest thing you'll ever do. I think it yeah. costs yeah. about a third the price of one bag of fertilizer. Yeah. Lanny, what's it cost? Seven, eight ninety nine. Eight ninety nine. Kidding? That's right. Yeah, the yeah. bargain of the century. It right. really is. We should give away some soil tests in the future. Well, let's That's do it. it. Yeah. Can we do that, Oscar? Give certificates uh, yeah oscar we're gonna hit you up for a little bit for some gifts here. I'll, I'll bring it up to my boss yeah well you tell chris we said hello and oscar next time you're coming through stop and we'll buy you buy you lunch there you go uh, will do. Will yeah, do. I'm sorry. I think I talked on top of you there, Oscar. We thank a lot of you guys and your company, and we appreciate what yes, you guys do. Yes, thank you do. for what you do and being so good at it because it helps us so it much. It makes our job easier. It yes. really does, especially Dudley's. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, guys. That's what we're here for. Yeah, come see us, Oscar. Thanks, Oscar. All right. Appreciate you guys' business. Take care. Yep. Hey, All so, right. Dud, real quick, on the soil test, what about for trees? Um, We can – I mean, you know, we can do it. There's – that's one of the – Things I'm just they'll like, test for. I got you. They will mm -hmm. test for trees. Um, trees are, I would I would say they're not quite as picky as oh, some yeah. of these, you know, precision ag type crops. But um, there's definitely limiting factors. Your you know, pH, we've over farmed yeah. our soils, and you know, all these hilltops have eroded over the years, and. So, yeah, you may have to do some inputs. And I think there's some more general things. You wouldn't have to get specific to every micronutrient, but sure. there's definitely going to be pH mm -hmm. issues and uh, certain macro nutrients needed for certain trees. Right. Yes. I think it's it's more of, you know, I get these results back, and it, it tells me what, what species I can and can't grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which ones will compete the best. Ah, that's so good. It's, it's a little that's bit different than but that's good information. annual crops, yes. Yes. for yeah. sure. Honestly, they could talk to us, you know, and you can just about tell because just some stuff is better on sandy or soil versus well drained versus, you know, sure wet versus, you know. But you never know what happened on that ground 80 no. years ago. No. Uh, it could have been farmed to death and you have no clue. Well, as you and I talked earlier, places that maybe the wrong chemicals were used and kind of sterilized the soil, maybe trace elements of that after years sure. of farming too. Yeah. So. Hey folks, it's Cus Strickland at Mossy Oak. You know, we believe here that the good we do will live long after we're gone, which is why on Saturday, September the 24th, we're holding the fourth annual Mossy Oak Properties National Day of Conservation. We challenge each of you to participate in a conservation activity where you call home, whether that be creating habitat for wildlife, planting trees, cleaning up a stream, giving to a conservation organization, or just introducing someone to the outdoors for the first time. Whatever you choose, we want everyone to know that if you love the outdoors, you're on the front lines of conservation efforts. Get your family and friends involved and be sure to tag Mossy Oak or use the hashtag Day of Conservation so we can see what you did. Hey, will you answer the challenge? The, the guys at the labs, those those soil tests, we we often we kind of take it for granted, but that's something everybody really needs to do, and it's not real expensive. So, Bronson, I know from what from you, you traveling the state and telling people how to do food plots, I know that's step one. That is step guys. one. That is what we preach. That is the single best money you can spend. What are the limiting factors uh, of your soil? Yeah, and you can't expect good results if you don't know that. Well, speaking of limiting factors, we've had you as a guest a number of times. Lanny, he's sat right there. Right there. He's eat, eating our food, anybody. drank yeah. our coffee. We but there's some things we don't know about you. So Dudley has prepared. So, so we have a little segment that we call Rapid Fire. It's brought to you by Springfield Armory. Right, right. And uh, they make some great pistols. And we would, uh, let's, let's, let's let Dudley, uh, we're going to turn him loose here. We'll see if we can now, learn can, a little bit. You can say neither, too. You know, okay. Uh, you can say both. You can say neither. I, you can say I just, neither. I, Neither's okay. Just don't overdo it, okay? Oh, God. I, I'll give you two neithers. Bronson, you do you. <laughs> All right. Dudley's rough. Okay, so 
a lot of these are obviously geared towards hunting or fishing. So uh, I don't want to have to say hunting or fishing after every question. So the, here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, pr probably not, but go All ahead. right. Morning or afternoon hunt? Morning. In state or out of state? In state. Bachelor bucks or rut bucks? Rut. Salt water or fresh water? Mm. Salt. Yeah, mm. figured. Sausage or bacon? Bacon. Shampoo or shampoo plus conditioner? That's <laughs> going to be one of those neithers right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's got the Bobby, Bobby uh, Cole there, dude. Uh, you know, I just wanted to know what kind of products you use. Grass yeah, doesn't grow in concrete. Yeah. Uh, but back in the day, uh, yeah. shampoo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Filet or ribeye? Ribeye. Mm. Uh, coffee black or dressed? Black. Persimmons or apples? Hunting. Oh, persimmons. Duck hunt or turkey hunt? <sighs> That's tough. Well, what time of year is it? Come on. <laughs> I've had I've had more experience duck hunting, but I am trying to address that okay. and become a better turkey hunter. Okay. That's, both. I'll, I'll take What's that. What's wrong with both? Yeah, both. Yeah. There you go. Uh, pie pies or um, Chick Fil A chicken sandwich? Ooh. Ooh. Chick Fil A. Uh, Balanza or Bursim? Good Lord. That's a, it depends. <laughs> all right, all right, you got the right. answer now. Uh, boneless or bone in? You got to provide fish, some, whatever. Uh, bone in. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified yeah, that. Yeah, for real. Uh, yacht rock or hard rock? <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger, hard rock. Now, as much as my wife despises it, yacht. I love uh, you even. I love you even more. <laughs> and finally, uh, Luke Bryan or Luke Combs? Oh, the Combs! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> yep. Plain right. sweet so far. Good answers. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That wasn't too painful. So was now, it? We, it now, now we know painful. more no, about came you. came to my past, so it, it reminded me of the being asked very similar uh, ducks or turkeys. Oh. It's like, wait a minute, you only got a, you can only pick. I got a gun to your head. You got to pick one, and I go. Pull the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I gotta have both. I, I was afraid I was gonna get backhanded by Tyson <laughs> if I said anything. So when good. he said it and he paused, I was holding up two fingers, going, "Just say both." Yeah. <laughs> oh, Couldn't do good. without either one of them. That's, that's right. right. So Bronson, did I hear you say you brought some questions for us? It just so happens that I did. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. Maybe Dudley can Dudley feel Dudley them for answer them because okay. I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Know it all. I'm nervous. And, I'm uh, sure he's going to pick I'll be your phone friend. All right. Well, Dudley's all of a sudden got a little beads of sweat. <laughs> Lanny would always, if you're ever on a game show, would be a great phone friend because he's got this ankle monitor and he's got he's on house arrest. He can't go anywhere, That's so right. you can always get Lanny. That's right. I've been on warehouse and arrest this week. <laughs> I would just say, like, if we're in a, a master's defense or Ph.D. orals, don't feel compelled to answer an answer Try to answer if you don't know. The safest thing is, sure. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Live another uh, day. Yeah, don't, this, don't, don't die. Well, this is going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were going to get deposed. And this, I, I do have a couple that are for people specifically, but I'll start generally with, uh, with Dudley. Thank you. Ah. Gosh. Why did, why did deer vanish from the southeastern U.S. 100 plus years ago? Um, agriculture. We cleared everything. That's part of it. What's the other? And you can phone a friend by meaning you could say, Bobby, Lanny. Um, I'm assuming we shot all of them. Yeah, yeah, meat yeah, hunt, yeah. Meat hunting? Yeah, market, market, market hunting. hunting. Loss market. of habitat, and we can lump all that together, market hunting, but unregulated harvest. Okay. Nah. Why do we have deer today? We have habitat, and we've got MDWFMP and state wildlife agencies regulating our harvest. Amen. Why do deer have a rumen? Mm -hmm. uh, to, what's the what's the purpose? To ferment and break down their food. Well, so they can go off and be in a secure area and lay down and and be away from uh, wherever they were feeding. Yeah. Go somewhere else and be safe. Yeah. Um, the, the, those are all correct. The the bottom line is that you need this sophisticated stomach to deal with a bunch of relatively lower quality vegetation. Uh, wow. it, it takes this four chambered mechanism to digest and get a bunch of calories out of what they eat. So in our world, they're just eating lettuce. 
but we couldn't get the calories out of it. So they have a different mechanism by hmm. which they, they do that. Gotcha. That's good stuff. So yeah. for the general public, what all animals that we're vaguely familiar with, I mean, obviously elk, rumens, but also cattle. But, but also cattle, uh, bison, buffalo, things like that. Those are all uh, ruminants. Uh, uh, what what you contrast it with is another big herbivore that you're all familiar with Pigs. that does not have a rumen. That's right. Even a bigger herbivore, pig would be an omnivore. That's right. Mm. They'll eat anything. What's a big old herbivore? A bear. No, they eat all kinds of mm -mm. stuff. Well, you're just walking <laughs> seriously. I'm just over throwing there. out answers. I'm not even thinking. Hey, you remember he said you could say, "I don't know." And so, some Camel. people love them. Some people love them, and some people, especially out west, in some circumstances, don't like them one bit. Being on native ranges, horse. a horse. Come on, horse. It's a monogastric. <laughs> He's just laying it out. So it has it. it has a different way. So wow. a monogastric like a horse is they have what is called a cecum. We have a cecum which is called an appendix. Ah, I wonder what the thing But was. rather than a, the cecum or appendix on us being pretty much non-functional, in a horse it's this huge structure, and it's their way, like a rumen, to get another shot at digesting the food before it goes out the colon. Very so interesting. That, so different strategies, different ways yeah, to do it. Yeah, we can't eat a bunch of before. dried Bermuda grass. And huh. <laughs> Calories. How many calories... For, so for a human being, about, let's generalize, how many calories do we need a day? What's the common? I need a lot. 2,000. About, about 2,000. Yeah. If you're a big guy in activity levels, it might be three or 35. What do you think a pregnant doe, no, 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 let's say she's had her fawns. She's had a couple fawns and she's lactating. Right. How many calories does she need every single day? This mm. is a great I'll question. answer that one. A bunch. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Millions a and millions. Lot. Millions and billions. <laughs> no, a lot. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. 5,000. 12,000. No, yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, Dudley's or more. More than that. 20. 20. About 20,000. A day. A yeah. day. How yeah. can she get How that? How do they that's eat? Amazing. They got to eat a bunch. And that gets back to kind of a topic at hand mm -hmm. is about food plots. And we're always talking about habitat management. But guess what? Still plots blown away. Guess what? When it's most critical is one of our worst time of the year. Exactly Unless right. you plan for it. Why do we typically, I mean, in our part of the world, in the southeast especially, but it's good going to the Midwest, uh, and you see a deer, a lot of someone will send up, oh, my gosh, look at this deer. And I went. That deer had access to soybeans during the summer. And it could be now clover mm -hmm. and something like that. But that deer had, and it had probably when it was born, its mom had access to that too. Because a lot of how great your deer is at five years old had to do with the foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Had as a, what your you mama, know, what your grandmama had. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the magic things about the ag areas is that food peaks at the Worst time for everything else. Right. And that's why I preach about clover because, you know, not everybody can grow a soybean in a small food plot, but just about anybody with a little help can grow clover. 20,000 calories. That's a lot of calories. That is incredible. That's a lot of biologic. Yeah. Really well, they're is. also getting more calories out of their food than we do by that, their system. That's right. Hmm. Ultimately, what stimulates the rut? Ultimately. Mm. Oh, Lanny. Uh, Lanny. Length of day. With the does. Ding, ding, ding. Thank you. Give me a bell. Can I, I need that one. Photo Thank period. You. Is, there, <laughs> is it also the the distance in time from when they had one last year, too? Yeah. So, um, typically, believe it or not, that is a that is a heritable trait. Yes. So, a, a fawn will inherit from her mother right. about what that time is. But what is stimulating that every year for the doe to start the hormonal right. uh sequence that's going on is photo period length right. of the day that's that's same thing as turkeys in the spring mm. when they start gobbling wood it's photo period too yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> true or today. false mm. true or false you might get this one bob you got a 50 percent chance <laughs> we'll let you answer it <laughs> does age specific i'll explain that a little bit better does age specific antler size influence a buck's breeding success meaning how many times does he breed? How many fawns does he have? What I mean by age-specific is 
within three-year-olds, within four-year-olds. I'm not talking about a yearling versus a four-year-old, but within an age class, does antler size affect a buck's breeding success? I think That's it, a I yes think or it, no. Not yeah, a, I not think yes. Book. Dudley, might you have an alternative answer? Well, I know you guys did a study. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I think you cut their antlers off maybe yeah you put right. the little horns and, on the big deer yeah. and, and big deer. i, I honestly can't the remember more, the outcome of that study she preferred the, the bigger deer. she preferred yeah. the more impressive antler yeah, yeah. survival so, of the fittest yeah. size matters big dog. It, it, it was very interesting of course that that is a, a, a research study and so we set it up where a doe had to uh assess the extremes really really tiny antlers and really really big antlers and she always favored the really large antlers. We did a show on that stuff. We, we? Jeff Foxworthy was on it, and he was right. so funny. At the, yeah. when we were talking about <laughs> that. Yeah, Toxie and Jeff Foxworthy was good. Yeah, that was but, a cool study. But in oh the goodness. wild, in the wild, there's there's no relationship when you control for age class, but because really that variation, the 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 antler size variation is based on the age of the bucks. Hmm. So a yearling versus a five year old. Uh, it is a big disparity yeah. in antler size. That and, and so. okay, now Lanny. Yo, is it my turn? It's your turn. It is now. I only got one right. I want to leave it like it is. <laughs> you, you, you triggered me a second okay, ago. Okay, right, right, let's try. Let's go. What's the difference between horns and antlers? Okay, <laughs> horns don't fall off. Antlers fall off each year. That's that's real. Excuse me. Hey, there. Good job, Lanny. <laughs> Thank you for and, giving and, me the easy ones. And <laughs> antlers are made of, antlers are essentially. Bone. Yeah. And horns are, it's like a nail in it. That's essentially. It's like a cuticle. Yeah. Keratin, right. maybe. Hair. Hair. Is that the right word? Hair. Yeah. Well, a pronghorn antelope is hair. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Man, you're just dropping all kind of knowledge on oh, the Bronson. Look, I sat in a cave with Toxie for like three days. We were trying oh, to, trying to ki oh, kill man. a man. <laughs> you sat in another cave <laughs> hunting. No, no, I was with you. We, remember we dug out in the side uh, of a mm -hmm, hill and mm -hmm. and I got in the very back of it with a camera. And I thought could, Troy was with me. No, man. that was me. Oh, really? If it was me. I still that's, have a little limp from the way I walked from oh sitting my God. in there. Yeah, we got one the first day, though. So We did. It and was one of the first things I ever filmed. And I'll tell you what, antelope has a high blood pressure. Yeah, that's oh it. Oh, my gosh. Bleed really bad. <laughs> I got one last one. So this is, this is less – it's still kind of biology, but um, – I was talking to the, the jury crew yesterday, and we were talking about today. You were so popular. And, All right, go ahead. And, did, did they invite you hunting? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, they did, but only after I invited myself. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, uh, you know, there's this uh, topic called logical fallacies. It's about uh, confirmation bias is a good example and the fallacy of sunken costs. They talked about a different kind of logic. They called it Bobby logic. No, oh, Bobby logic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't know what that means. I was hoping somebody could fill me in on what, what is Bobby logic. I think that's just a it is the, it is It's the, a moving target. It's, it's the opposite it of regular logic, <laughs> <laughs> if that helps any. Somewhat in the Webster Dictionary, somewhere around chaos and monkey business. Somewhere yeah. right in there. There, there you go. That's, that's right. probably the answer right there. So. <laughs> that's oh, good. Really? Chaos and monkey business. Hey, that was awesome. Thanks, Bronson. Y'all passed. All right. Yeah, Bobby Logic. Well, you know, like, when you decide to double park at a restaurant or come in going through the exit, that's Bobby Logic. He's yes. able to think about the situation and decide, you know, I, I think I can get away with double parking because there's not many people here. Hmm. Yeah. Well, right. All right, so let's change the subject and let's <laughs> let's get let's. We'll do a whole podcast on Bobby Lodge. At some point, we could. Yeah, yeah. yeah when okay. we run out of things to talk about, that'd be. Well, a good we could talk one, about so. it all day. So, Bronson, if if we think about all that you brought up, we learned something there. Mm -hmm. That twenty thousand mm -hmm. calories was pretty fascinating. But as we go into fall and winter, we think about uh, what we want to plant. It can, is there another way to come at this and think about what a deer needs? Is there is, would that be a better way? Or are we overthinking it, so to speak? I, I think you're you're overthinking it. Um, so so I think there are levels of good. I think it's very site specific and time specific. Where yeah, you can tweak it and be a little bit better. But to me, the bottom line, the foundation is just going to be provide food, mm -hmm. and that's acres. Make sure you have the ratio of the number of deer you have to how much food you have, and 
what's that term you use all the time, Bobby, on a, a food Buffet. plot that's browsed yeah. down? Lip high. Yeah. Lip high. Yeah. yeah. If you have a bunch of lip high food plots, you're not doing your job. Deer don't have enough to eat. A, a, another little stat I was going to ask you was relative to over the course of a year, how much quantity-wise d- does a deer eat? And, and literally you start talking about over a ton Wow. Over a ton of food, oh, and that's yeah. from one single deer. So when you have too many deer on your property, you're not working on your habitat, and you have a relatively small amount of food plot acreage, that is why your deer are small and skinny and not healthy, and antler production is, is very, very poor. We just talked about the dietary needs every single day. That was during summer, and it's not as much in, in the winter. But I would say first and foremost is getting forage biomass out there. Then within that, there's a whole bunch of really good plants that you can do uh, to provide that. And, and, and to me, I think the great system is using a cereal grain, using a clover or clovers, depending on your objectives, and a brassica. In, in my mind, you're just checking every single box with, with, with that suite of species there. Mm. You, you get into the clovers, and then we have the annual clovers, and then we have the perennial clovers. And with the annuals, I like to think about staggering those. So you have some that are going to mature relatively early in the spring. Some are going to mature relatively late. Literally, there are some annual clovers in June and July that are still producing. So Al- Is Alice Clover one of those? Um, Isn't it an annual? That, that is an annual late maturing. Yeah, I thought so. A- a- absolutely. Not many people yeah. use that anymore. And and red clover is another great example as well. So it's just putting those together to maximize the amount of forage that that you can produce. Yeah, and going back to your lip high comment, Lanny, we we hear it all the time. Guys, used to be, it used to, I'm going to say, going back in time, guys were proud and they'd say, boy, the boy, the deer eat just murdering my food plot. Mm -hmm. They got it eaten down. But that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. And then we got to think about these deer, you know, a lot of, they're still out there when hunting season's over with. So there's, you know, January and February and the first part of March. There needs to be some groceries there. Yeah, when they're neglected the most. February is really, Rough. really tough. Right. When, from February until spring green up it, it is really, really hard. And that's where a lot of these forages can, can play a very important role. So do y'all have a, a ratio that y'all recommend? So if a guy's got 100 acres, it, is there a ratio that, that – can make sense of how many acres of food plots he needs because I guess it depends a lot on what's around him, but yeah, it, it depends. It's probably it, your I answer. I hate yeah. it, but but it's really going to depend on the number of deer and the amount of food your habitat's providing. Yeah, the natural. I mean, the thing that comes back again and again is like, and, and again, we're in the food pot business, and it's very critical. You can do magical things with it, but the first thing for people to do is to set the maximum carrying capacity of their place mm-hmm. across all the acreage in some form first. And then the deer close to that or under that carrying capacity, then the food plot can really be magic. And so, but if you don't, and you're not managing that, and you're not, you hadn't taken enough mouths off, and you don't have enough, uh, you know, natural forage and habitat farm, you're fighting an uphill battle. And you're going to, honestly, some of the I was thinking about why is the food plot lip high? Well, it's not only just because um, you're overpopulated and don't have enough or whatever. It could be because you overplanted, or it could be because you didn't take your soil test and actually, you know, grow a lot of food for them too. Yeah, one but of the-, the one thing it's hard for people to, and you can't. It's hard to do it on a podcast. Right. You almost hope that's why on the ground biologists can make a living by assessing the place. But if you can raise the carrying capacity of your place you can do i'll give you an example of all the people i know probably although mark drew might be there but i'd say jeff foxworthy and glenn who runs his place as good as i've ever seen no limit to the resources and the smarts and the equipment and everything to raise the best deer you just about ever seen uh you know protein feeders alfalfa fields unbelievable crops and they will tell you and jeff will tell you too that his number one priority first is that natural carrying capacity before any of that other stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so shooting does. Well, but not, yeah, but I mean, that's one thing. You can shoot them down, but more, I, I'm going to lean to him. But I would say a higher priority is maximize the carrying capacity first 
Then and also adjust. do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So habitat. Yeah. Or food else you, in the food in the woods. Food in your fields. Yeah. So if you knock your deer way down and you still don't have anything to eat, you're still not going to have great deer. Right. So um, I'm just saying, you just about can't plant enough year-round forage. Uh, you know, if you don't have the right, you know, habitat mm-hmm. and carrying capacity. It, it just Why becomes, I love clover because it yeah. does fill in some gaps like nothing else that we have, actually, or, or that there is available. I don't know of another no. product, you know, certainly not an ag product that fits that bill, no. you know, like clover does. I like the clover and chicory. So, so yes. help yourself by managing the habitat as well. Yes. Because if you just have to rely on 1% or half a percent or whatever of your property to produce food plots, you got uphill sledding to do mm-hmm. if you're going to make any difference and see an effect. And most people want to see an effect. They want bigger deer. They want better antlers. They want greater fawn production, et cetera. But it's the, the comparison we use is kind of like a seesaw, is that when, when the habitat gets better, you do your work and the habitat gets better, now the, the, the deer harvest as well. The, the quality is going to go down because you have too many mouths to feed. So you're always looking for that balance point and, and then supplement. So take something good mm-hmm. and make it so much better with, with your food plots. That, that makes your job easier. Yeah. Lanny, you look like you had something you were going to say. Uh, he, he mentioned some things about tonnage, which I, I'm in, completely infatuated with. You Did you mention that a whitetail needs one ton of food per more forage? What was it? What was the tonnage figure? Yeah, and, and it depends on the size of the deer, a right. buck and a doe and all that. But just consider your average deer, like a 105-pound doe, is going to need about a ton of forage over the course of a year. So that's two thousand pounds of forage. Yeah, and, put, and that's the put dry that in garbage matter. bags that, and that put is, it on a trailer. That you know, is, that's a lot of that's food. That's a lot of food. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, and that's really with is. the water weight extracted, which mm-hmm. is the way we measure stuff. So it may be four thousand. Right. If you went out and picked the stuff and put it on a scale with the water in there. Yeah. I mean, that in itself will tell you how much food plants so you common, cannot plant enough. Yeah, but a common mistake people make because I know because I have is like you judge. Even with cameras and stuff, we judge our place by how many deer we see. We're not seeing deer. Don't shoot any more deer. I'm not seeing enough deer. Well, that's that's no way to judge. Right. You know your place, um, <laughs> and the the and, and tracks trails. That's no way to judge the population. Honestly, the best. I mean, if you keep up with all deer sightings all year, probably somewhat. But uh, the camera census done in a, a good scientific way is really good. Uh, but utilization cages will tell you a lot. Yeah. I was going to say earlier, we we're talking about why you need a soil test. Along with that, you also need uh, an exclusion cage or a utilization mm-hmm. cage. Yeah. Tells you so much. And learn some learn some uh, native plants that they munch on and mm-hmm. right. uh, those indicator those plants. Days. And collect that harvest data and observation data in during during hunting season. So are there other indicators, like if you're a guy this time of year and you're seeing... Or a gal. Or a gal, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Toxie. So uh, I forgot what I was where I was going with that now. But So if, if you're a guy or a gal and you're seeing uh, does with twins or two mm-hmm. fawns on your... Is that a good indicator? Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, so that that's going to be... Yeah, that's very good for in, in the short term relative to uh relative to the carrying capacity and the amount of food they have that's good she that means there is enough available nutrition she's had successful pregnancy she's had two fawns but you can also have you know smaller deer with with two fawns Mm. so what is really i think biologically is just really beautiful about deer is the one way they cope with nutritional stress is they get smaller I'm not talking about within a year. I'm talking about over a decade, over over 100 years. That is why you see this regional variation in the size of the deer. They become adapted to that particular environment and how much food it is. And so you'll end up with a a, a mature doe maybe 90 pounds in one region and have twin fawns. A mature doe maybe 140 pounds in another region and have twin fawns. So... um, it's one of those that is generally a good sign because if you're only seeing, on average, half a fawn or less per doe, you, you got you big issues. problems. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it could right. be nutrition. 
It could be back to your habitat management and a predator issue, but bottom line is you know you've got problems. Nature yeah. is amazing. Yeah, oh, my is. goodness. I'm telling you. Yeah. And those little fellows are so bright red mm -hmm. with those white spots. How do they they're, hide they're but when just, they sit down? So Doc, so you, there was a video a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. You had walked up on uh, I know. I was riding a four-wheeler checking one of our duck ponds to decide whether I was going to try to plant some God's choice or just spray what was there because there's a lot of natural, mm -hmm. you know, wetlands. Species, barnyard grass is the top one. But so I was cutting across it just to see what had grown up there. It was probably two years ago. And on a four wheeler, and the grass was probably knee deep or more. And I just did. And I heard the noise too. And then I just, I literally stood on the hand brakes and the back end came up in the air. It almost flipped, but I stopped maybe two, three feet from running over this phone. It dead, would have run dead over it. And it just stood there. Bleating. And so I grabbed my phone and took a video, and it just kept bleating and didn't move. I knew mom had to be close by. So I moved and got a really good one. And I'm, you know, people look like a professional you know, good. videographer. Oh, oh, but with a, with a, uh, <laughs> with good, an though. Apple iPhone today at two yards, you can be, you know. A, yeah, it was a cute little guy. So like, anyway, I think it's been the most watched video. I think so, too. Like total universe, 10 million views or something. But, you know, I knew better than to stick around. I didn't get near it. I got a good video, and I put it in reverse and back right back over my same tracks and got out of there. Everybody thinks that mom abandoned them, but she was sitting right there. Yeah, she was watching she yeah, she's yeah. watching you. Yeah. Wow. She's got to go get, eat a ton of food. It was a miracle yeah. I didn't run over. <laughs> yeah, she's like She's yeah. got to go get 20,000 20, calories. 20,000 calories. For that. I right. thought but I they, are, they are the cutest. I've run across some every year. They are the cutest thing. Oh, my goodness. I there saw somebody are. on facebook the other day that had a phone in the truck with them and i was like oh my oh, god i saw that you know with my little place over there uh you know oh, my, my wife has gotten when she enjoys doing the trail cameras and we've gotten some phones on there and it just has gotten her so interested in that property mm -hmm. and making it better yeah then we'll get off on another topic. That's called that's the Moss Hill property story there, because um, there's nothing like having your own little place, no matter where it is, and yeah. the whole family gets involved in it like that. Yeah, it's fun. It's amazing. Um, back to the whole February food and February thing. You know, uh, I know we've beat the soil test into the ground, and we always do, but it's so important. Uh, if you follow your your soil test, um, that can be the difference in that field yellowing up yes. when they need it the most or having lush green vegetation on the ground. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the ground is cold, it's wet, uh, it's much harder for the plants to assimilate the nutrients and, and make a real pretty green plant. Uh, well, it's, but it's if probably the, you know, if you, if, if you do what I said earlier and you actually go in and, and improve the, the carrying capacity of your habitat, it's still going to be nature's weakest time of year when sure. food plots could make the biggest difference, even more than that late summer stress period. And if you look at people like a Mark Drury, some of their best hunting is when they actually prepare stuff season. specifically okay. to have a high energy food in the late, late season. And it's unbelievable. I remember seeing a video that Roy Oswald had on his place in northern Missouri, and he had left a 30-acre stand in soybean field. And I saw that. It yeah. was unbelievable how many deer were using that soybean field in January. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, my point, point being that food plots being important to your place may be at its peak in the late winter stress period more than any time. You know, uh, yeah. from a hunting standpoint, for sure. And if you don't yeah. do the soil test, and if you don't have fertile nutrients in the soil, you probably won't have anything. No. So, Bronson, it's got to excite you to hear folks are interested in trying to do right, trying to improve habitat, and trying to manage their properties. Absolutely. It, do you feel like it's gaining in popularity? Yeah, yeah I, I, I do. Uh, and, and that's based on the the questions that we get. That's based on through social media and. Uh, and when you really start looking back, if you go on a scale of decade by decade, we're, we're harvesting a lot of big, mature bucks in the southeast and in Mississippi. I mean, it was not this way 30, 40 years ago. No, what? you're right. No, the good old days actually are today. They yeah, really are. That's right. Yeah. So, so I think the, the education and teaching people on what to do and how to do it, 
I think they're picking it up and applying it, and, and it's working. I can remember hunting around here in West Point and seeing a spike and just absolutely my heart about leaped out of my chest to see a cow horn spike even. Yeah. You know, it was – I think we take it for granted sometimes. You, you hunted back then. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Bronson, do you remember your first deer? I absolutely do. Yeah. Can, can you tell us that story real quick? Yeah. Well, the, the season before uh, – I had missed what would have been my, my first. So there's a, a lot of little stories here. The deer I first missed was on what back then was called a doe day. Oh, okay. I love doe day. It was like, that like the 22nd <laughs> and 23rd of December. Oh, yeah. It was yep. better so than that, Christmas. That was, I grew up, grew up in Georgia, and I think it was a, mm. the time in between Christmas and New Year's. We had gotcha. a little special season, and, and you could kill some does then. Doe so day. We don't even think about doe days now, but mm -hmm. that's, again, the it's deer doe year now. Doe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. doe all year. That's right. And I had missed uh, with a, an open sight gun that I had just gotten for Christmas. And this is a, a caliber a lot of people aren't familiar with. Ooh. A 307 Winchester. Oh. Wow. Okay. Never heard so of that. So it's essentially a 308 that has a rim on it and, and a flat nose or blunt nose so you can cycle it through a lever action. So it was, it's a lever action gun, Model 94 type. Hmm. But uh, you can't find shells for it everywhere. Yeah, it's game <laughs> no. I've still got about 50 rounds I have saved. I'd say you better hang on to them and not practice. Yeah, yeah. Three and then, matches. okay, so uh, back to some cool biology. And so then uh, opening day of the following year, I now had a scope on that gun. And uh, it got to be late in the morning after 9 or 10 o'clock. And I thought all was over and I'm all, you know, just can't believe it. I'm skunk because it's opening day. You're hearing shots all around, and everybody else is getting one. And here <laughs> comes one, you know, pops pops through, and of course I wasn't pulling jaw bones. I, I didn't know anything back then. It's probably a two year old, is what it was, uh, but it was a little six pointer. And then I killed it, of course, had a successful shot, and then I got over to it. And it's one of the questions I deal with, at least, uh, oh I don't know, almost every every other day now, when deer season gets here, it's like, what are these? things all over my buck does it have cancer it's mm. got tumors growing all over it of course wow. it, had, it had three or four fibromas on it hmm. yeah so did that scare you from eating the meat it it uh i, I asked the the elder you know the the, the people in the camp yeah. and uh, of course they didn't know either nobody really did but when we just started skinning it and pulling it back and when we saw that it was confined to the the skin and it wasn't in the meat and buddy, I, I was going to eat it anyway. That's right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, that's my first day. That was yeah. your baby. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, but so it, it, if guys encounter that today, that you meat is totally th fine. The uh, meat is totally. You say fine. a three point, six, six point, six point. Okay, yeah. mine was a three point. Yeah, mine was a spike, yeah. and definitely less than two years old. <laughs> 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 yeah, it probably still had some of those twenty thousand calories in it. <laughs> that was, yeah. Yeah. it was <laughs> antlers visible above that's hairline. Right. <laughs> I was pumped. And, and Lanny, <laughs> I, I may be retelling the story subconsciously because I, I just don't want to think of, gum if I shot a high-quality yearling back then, a six-pointer <laughs> that was a yearling. Oh, yeah. Nowadays, that'd kill me yeah. for that to happen. That's but true. I say it was a two-year-old, but it may have been a yearling. Yeah. Well, I can see how excited that it makes you. Times. That's a good memory for you to bring Oh, it's up. great. I actually came across the picture literally about two weeks ago. So oh, I just relived awesome. all that in my mind. Oh, well, we yeah. need that. We need that. We Boy, should all try to bring our first deer pictures in here. It'll be interesting. Yeah, it would be. I think we all could I've probably got, find them. Yeah. I've got quite a few. I've got some of my friends. Cause we, because we had such a good place to go, there weren't many deer when I was a kid. I've got, I bet, a dozen, 15 of my friends with their first deer going with us and blood on her. Sonny, yeah, I got yeah. Sonny. He's got like a red shirt on. He's standing over a little eight-point. He shot <laughs> blood everywhere and on his face. Oh, that's good that's times. a good day. You know, great point to make about all of this stuff we do is to and I, I, I hearken back it just hit me like a ton of bricks when my own son said something that i needed to hear and daniel was on a podcast said let's don't lose our our sense of wonderment that we had as a child this podcast, yes right. and he said that w it just -U like a lightning bolt mm -hmm. i related to that and how I, I use that all the time now even about the job we're doing stuff but we get stale and dry and used to it and we complain and, you know, fuss and moan about stuff. And, man, 
just think about the sense of wonderment you had that day right. and how right. special that is. We we should – Bobby's really good at keeping that going. I have it All day. seasons of the year, he's mm – -hmm. The Bobby logic is like, you know, <laughs> he kills a, a pintail or a redhead or some rare duck, and he looks like a kid in wonderment. And so, I just think if we got Remember how much he freaked out about that kudzu vine he oh, brought yeah. into the office? That's right. It's still over there. He's got it. So I'm just saying. <laughs> He's got a world record kudzu vine in the office. Oh, laughing aside, if we teach people stuff besides all the science and all, is that – don't lose that sense of wonderment because yeah. it's life Good short. And you just can, open your eyes yeah, out there. It is absolutely. all around you. We're so lucky to get to do what we do as outdoorsmen oh, and right. hunters and fishermen and stuff, too. Man, don't take it for granted. Nope. Mm. That's mm. right. Dudley, have you got a, 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 a question today? An ask study? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I sure do. Yeah, well, let's go Since ahead. you bombed all the ones that <laughs> Bronson gave you, maybe you can answer I, your own. I, I, I had, an, <laughs> I had another one and kind of changed it last minute. Uh, but... Um, Jay Pope emailed me the other day and just and had some questions about mulching trees. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this is kind of specific, but I, I want to take it broad and, and just go over mulching. Uh, but uh, he says, we have access to a lot of pine straw. Would the oaks like pine straw much or would the pine straw adversely affect them or the soil? Uh, the current soil pH is about 4.9. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sandy soil. Uh, CEC of four six uh, per the soil test. So um, I like that he did a soil test and was inquisitive about what what to do to make the situation better. You know, make the trees grow faster. Did you say what kind of trees? Uh, survive and thrive. No, but uh, he says oaks. Oaks, okay. Oaks. Yeah. Um, my understanding, and I, I'm not a soil scientist, but I, I did take the class. And you um, stayed in the Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> I knew right. that was coming. <laughs> um, but when anything organic breaks down and it composts, it's usually, it usually doesn't cause an acidic reaction with the soil. A lot of people think that pine straw will make the pH, and I hope I'm not wrong here, but when things break down, it usually tends to have a neutral reaction, like a, any kind of compost. It'll get a create nitrogen, um, won't it? Well, uh, you know, the brown is supposedly carbon, the green is nitrogen. You, you try to put it at the right ratio and right. all that. But um, usually the final product, which is, is compost, is, is generally close to neutral. So whether there was pine trees there or oak trees, that doesn't have a lot of effect. Yeah, I guess my um, only question, I would question myself, I would think it would be a positive other than is there an issue with the rosin that's in the pine needle? Right. It could be uh, some type of... Yeah, uh, that would be my only question, to be honest with uh, you. What do you call the... the um, what's the fancy word for the substances in, in this plant material that breaks down? Terpenes, Terpenes. and all of that. Mm -hmm. But um, So he just wanted to know if pine straw would make a good mulch. And, and pine straw makes an excellent mulch. Yeah. Anything that's organic is going to make a, a better mulch than having nothing there. Yeah, and it's, um, it's going to protect invasives yeah, it's to a degree. Shade, yeah. It's going to shade the sun. The soil is going to be a little bit cooler in the root zone. It's going to hold more um, Again, it's like a little compost pile over your tree, so you're going to have more microorganisms and all that good life that's going to help uh, make those nutrients more available. Um, now, one thing pine straw doesn't do very well is it doesn't trap moisture that's trying to evaporate out of the soil. So something that's more yeah. dense, like leaves, uh, pine bark, um, things like that. You know, a lot of people nowadays will use uh, right. like sheet plastic or that woven silt fence material. Right. So when, uh, like on the side of a road, uh, a lot of times you see stuff is greener right on the edge of the pavement right, cause it's, because it's, it's trapping cheating. moisture yeah. that's it's, trying it's, to evaporate out of the soil and it's directing well, it to the roots. Well, it's, isn't it cheating and getting some of the nutrients from under the road that isn't used up by something else too? That and, and, I, and moisture. Yeah. So uh, we're splitting hairs here, but you know things like flat leaves would probably be better at, at trapping moisture, moisture that's trying to evaporate than pine needles. Yeah. Than pine sense. needles. But, but again, is, is this individual trees like planted in tubes? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, I would also add maybe if that's what he has access to uh, efficiently, then 
you know, double or triple the thickness of that's, the pine that's straw. That's exactly what might. I told him. Okay. Um, that's a, a more airy substance. Yeah. So you can afford, you can pile it higher without negatively affecting right. the, yeah. the root system. But uh, I like it in my garden, I'll say that. Yeah, any mulch is better than no yeah, mulch. Yes. And the more you add, the more it breaks down. You're forming a little topsoil organic layer. Any 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 excuse to give your trees, uh, your oaks that you get from us, a year or two head start on everything else is huge. Exactly. You know, so that mulch, any kind of mulch, but, you know. I, um, there's so many ways you can do it. You can plant them and walk away and kind of do the natural thing. But if you can baby them a little bit yeah. for the first three or four years, I'm, I'm all for it. I love mulching mine with something. Yeah, you know. and it's it's free. I mean, you, you don't have to go buy bagged material. No. You can just go rake some stuff up or save your grass. Even if you, you know, have to buy material, a bale of pine straw is really cheap. Mm -hmm. you know, so, Correct. You know. So, anyway, I hope that helps, Jay, and I – Hope that helps everybody else. Good stuff. Yeah, that was good. So, Bronson, I've got one last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, we always like to ask a question. We've asked you this before, and so a listener that left us a review could potentially win a prize if you get this question correctly. He's done this before. He's and old hat. Lanny, uh, this guy's name is uh, – so we can edit this out if it's bad, but tell me if this was bad. Chaff Ducker. Is that a bad? I have no idea. Yeah, I, I don't. So he said, hey, guys, can't get enough of y'all's podcast. Love listening and learning from you guys and your guests. Keep up the good work. And his name is Chuff Ducker. Spell it. Now, Spell it for C -H -O -F -F -D -U -C -K -E -R. I, If that's some kind of, I'm I don't know. I'm guessing it's C. Hoff. I'm guessing it's first letter, last name. Hoff Ducker. Ducker. Okay, all right. So Charles Hoff. Totally. Totally. There you go. Hey. Okay, so he, brilliant. Well, we'd like for this guy to win some. He left us a nice review. So he probably all this has some is, good duck hunting. So yeah. all this is. Uh, I hope so. Am I dentist? I'm supposed to get a crown. I was hoping you get a root canal. Man. <laughs> so, uh, so we're, the, the, he can win a Stormy Cromer hat. They're a great hat. They're available in at, Bottomland. No, in, tree, in the original tree oh, stand. Man. Yeah, they're oh, gorgeous. Wow. gorgeous. That's a Bobby Logic garment. Yeah, so you can it. see that at www.stormycromer.com. What was that? www. <laughs> Bob, Bobby, Bobby and Daniel are dueling each other for the goofiest hat. <laughs> well, I've always had work. a goofy hat. This is a very cool hat. It, it's super warm. For guys, you know, D Bronson, you would love this with that. I, he's, I, he's, saying that. <laughs> he's saying you need to warm your head for something. Yes, yeah. Okay, so here's the question. Right now, <laughs> on her milk sack of the doe, the a white tailed doe in the south, right now, on her milk sack, which is bulging full of milk right now, we're seeing them. How many teats does she have? <laughs> is it four, five, or six? <laughs> You know it's not five. <laughs> <laughs> the correct, the correct term is utter. Yeah, okay. Rather yeah. than not, milk sack. Not teat. And <laughs> <laughs> she has four nipples. There you go. That, that's that's right. But you know right. what? Bobby I, I, didn't pass over at Mississippi State. I, I kind of I said you know whatever answer he comes up with, I'm gonna say that's right because I'm not really. But when I asked Jeeves on the computer, it said four. So there you He's go. He's still out there. Four. He's still out there. Yeah. Yeah. So they have four teats. How about they that? Do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tits. T T E A T E A T S. Is that acceptable? I think that's a country uh, term. Salmon, salmon, tomato, tomato. I've yeah. Google it. T E A T S. <laughs> nipples. It's, uh, nipples. Yeah, well, it's, I think that's better than saying nipples. Okay. Actually, yeah. Okay. Teats it is. Guys, I look, I learned the whole 20, I'm too. still, that 20,000 calories a day. It's a fun fact. And 2,000 pounds of dry matter. That is. Think about, but how much? Just. He's talking about oh, that, 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 uh, dough nursing, but think about 25 degrees in the rut in a grown white tail or deer during hunting season when it gets really, really cold and that metabolism slipped mm -hmm. way up. I bet it's getting close to that in some cases. Well, and think about what, what we see with bucks over the winter time. I mean, we've talked about it, it before. Smaller, right? They're going to, they're going to lose down. anywhere from five to sometimes 25%. Yeah. And so when they're not eating every single day because their mind has shifted and now they're chasing and courting and all that kind of stuff, and they can't keep that up, then you, you start losing weight. Mm -hmm. And that's why right after the rut, that's when you see it. That's when they shift to going back to food as being a priority. And, and most of your deer are going to live through it down here, 
But if you get further north and they expend too much and spring green up happens too late, that's when deer start dying. Winter kill. It's, that's mm -hmm. when you have some winter kill. Bobby, yeah. is that why you lost 20 pounds your freshman year of college? <laughs> They're trying yeah. to secure breeding opportunity. <laughs> so Gosh, can, I think I gained 30 pounds my freshman can, year. You weren't running as hard. I wouldn't have told that one, brother. Can, <laughs> you, <laughs> can you turn it into like a pounds per day of – of dry matter so that that deer we're talking about are they eating between i've always heard between eight and 12 pounds is that a, is that about right I, I think i think that would be for a, a larger deer closer to a 200 pound deer and that and that could be including some water weight yeah uh usually the way we would express it is two and a half to three percent of their body weight dry matter mm. so a hundred pound doe is once you take the water out going to eat two to three pounds yeah so I'm that guy at the table that's that's likes antlers. So I, that's what I think. In we terms all of, like so, them, so, of course. Yeah. I wonder how much we eat a year. You know what I use a lot because sometimes that doesn't. Oh, okay. Well, two or three pounds that doesn't sound like a lot. But then you put it in kind of human terms. How many quarter pounders of cheese? Right. Well, is that is three pounds. Right. You know. That's a lot of hamburgers. That's a lot of hamburger. Even if you're like Bobby and you order a cheeseburger with no cheese. That's right. Is that Bobby logic? Yeah. yeah. That, is, that is the definition of Bobby <laughs> yeah. logic. He's, this yeah. guy's great. Oh, Secrets yeah. revealed. Yeah, I do. I order cheeseburgers with no cheese. Yeah. <sighs> I'll never understand that one. But. Sweet tea with no cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, look, guys, before we close this out, time out. I'm on, I've got a, uh, I got a surprise for everybody. There's a young lady out in Utah that was uh, followed and uh, by a mountain lion down the side of a mountain out there. She was, uh, she was shed hunting, and it's her, the story's just incredible. And, you know, we all love panthers and long-tailed cats and all that, so I thought everybody would enjoy this one. So, David, if we could get her on the phone, let's get her to tell her story. Hello. Hello, Lauren. We are so glad that you could join us. I'm Bobby Cole, and we've got Dudley Phelps sitting next to me, Lanny Wallace writing on his hands. He's writing your name down on his hand. I'm going to get it right, Lauren. We've got the boss, okay. Toxie Hayes, sitting at the table. And then next to him, we've got Dr. Bronson Strickland, who's a biologist from Mississippi State and uh, probably one of the smartest guys we know. But he's uh, he's joined us here. And look, we I've already – I'm, I'm going to mispronounce your name already. but Lorian. Lorian. You're good. We heard that you had an encounter with a mountain lion, and we I were did. we were hoping you could tell us what were you doing, what happened, and could you could you kind of tell us about it? Well, it was um, opening day of the archery hunt here in Utah, and so me and a couple of my friends headed out, um, and we were in Coola County in Utah, and um, we were out in pretty much like the middle of nowhere. Um, just working our way in this, in this steep, um, canyon. Um, so, um, we're working our way to the top and I, instead of walking the top of the ravine with everyone, I decided to stay in the bottom of, of the deep ravine. And so everyone was at the top and I was in the bottom and I was just working my way through the trees. It was really rocky and steep. And I started smelling something dead and I was like oh mm. like maybe that's a dead deer I, it was it was really gross and I'd only smelt it for about a split of a second and then to my right I heard crashing and felt something grab my leg like swipe my leg and it took me a second to realize like what I was looking at and then I realized that I was face to face with a mountain lion and I used I had a hiking stick in my right hand and to get it away I hit it in the head and it backed up and I was still kind of like in shock, like, holy crap, because it's kind of always been a fear of mine. Like yeah. I'm in the woods a lot <laughs> and um, we, it's like an inside joke. We're always joking around like that. We're going to die from a mountain lion or we're going to encounter a mountain lion. And so I couldn't believe it was actually happening. And I started screaming up the hill to everyone, like letting them know that there was a mountain lion and it was not very happy with me being right there. Mountain lion. Babe. What happened after that was it walked around a tree and it started coming towards me and it lashed at me like four times, like showing its teeth, hissing, using its paw to try and like scratch at me. 
So I used my hiking stick again, and I hit it in the head a couple times, and it backed up. And then you can hear in the video, like, everyone saying, like, what? And, like, I was telling them, like, mountain lion. And that's when I decided to get my phone out and record because I was like, no one's going to believe me if I tell them that, like, this just happened. So pulled my phone out and started recording. And I know not to turn my back to a mountain lion because I know that they can, like, chase after you or whatever. So I stayed having eye contact with it, and I was just going to back up slowly. Well, I tried backing up, and I was stuck in thick shrubs and trees. And there was really no way around. So in a way, it had me cornered. So while I was recording in my head, I was thinking, okay, how am I going to get out of here? Because if I move to my right, I'm going to get too close to it. And if I move to my left, I'm still going to have to get too close to it. And in the video, towards the end, you can see that it's walking towards me. Now, I carry this case on my pack that I put my phone in to record. And I actually did not mean to end the video. I ended it on accident by trying to sit because I... I wanted both my hands in case something happened. And I ended the video on accident by trying to put it in my case. And then after I put it in my case, I didn't realize it was ended. And the cat lashed at me one more time. I hit it in the head with my stick. It backed up farther than what it did the first time. And I slowly, like, schooled my way around the trees and started slowly backing up, um, up the hill. And everyone was waiting for me at the top. And I was scared to check my leg. The adrenaline was very high. I was still in shock. So I didn't feel any pain or anything. So I was just hoping my leg wasn't like cut open and it was bad. So we all, I had to back up all the way up the hill, which was very hard because I was so terrified. My legs were trembling and it was, I kept stumbling everywhere. Well, we got to the top and we all backed up coming out of the canyon and it followed us for about a mile and then just took took off down the ravine again and I'm sure she wasn't out to eat me I'm sure that I had just walked right past whatever she had just killed and I didn't even realize it mm. oh my goodness so this thing was close enough to you that you hit it in the head with a stick I mean that's yes. like a bad dream that is wild and hey only, kudos for holding your composure that yeah. Is, yeah I only amazing. Can, I only have a bruise and then you can like see where it's nails I have like four or five just like cuts where her leg just kind of just like swiped me and that's it. So it mm. wasn't even bad. Oh, wow. So you think she was behind you and swiped at your leg with her paw? I mean, obviously. Yeah, she definitely did. Like I said, I heard the crashing and then felt something grab my leg and she was like right there. So. Goodness yep. gracious. That's insane. Did, that is that is nuts. Did your, the friends that were waiting for you at the top, did they actually get to see the mountain lion? Um, so I was also with my girlfriend and she, she came down and she was telling me like, come up here. Like, and I, and that's in, also in the video, you can hear me say, I can't. It's because she was telling me to back up, up the mountain. And that's when I was like, kind of stuck in a sticky situation. And she was the only one who got to see, she said she was standing at the top and she could see that I was like face to face with it. Wow. Oh, goodness. Yep. I need to get you a pistol. <laughs> I know. Springfield Armory. I, I, yeah, there's a plug. Brownie. Right yeah, I usually, I usually go prepared. So I usually, um, like over my, so my pack has a strap across like the chest, and I usually carry like I'll strap like a big knife just in case anything were to happen. And I actually had bear spray, which I could have used, but I was so scared that I forgot it was on my side. Like it was in the pouch of the pack but it was like on my side where i easily could have grabbed it just in case but i totally forgot that but yeah, no like I would do. <laughs> yeah i mean when you're in those situations you can't say what you would have done yeah, and, maintain your adrenaline eye, is, yeah. and maintain an eye contact you know i don't want to look away from it to look for something i want to keep my eyes on it oh yeah no i was not looking away from no it. way <laughs> well so one of the reasons i wanted to have you on is well, i wanted to hear this story but you know there's a lot of guys that are going to travel out west this Heading September there, and right? October and, and gals, they, you and, know, gals. And, yes. and gals, yeah, and and they might encounter, and maybe they could learn something from this. And I've already learned that keeping that eye contact. Oh, I, yeah. It was Bronson. What's going on with the eye contact from a biologist's point of view? I, I think it's just that the in this case the humans, the prey, or or could be, is that you are are keeping an eye and you are watching the predator so that it's not going to be an easy kill. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know that that's one of the things we always say is is you're always looking at at the the predator in this in this case a mountain lion or cougar and i think it yep. just discourages them and that's why don't walk away and this is this is way outside the scope of this conversation but you know even in places like india where you'll have kills yeah. from tigers they will actually color or tattoo or some way put eyes on the back of their head whether yep. that's effective or not but at least those people think so think i've so. seen that i always yeah. wondered what that yeah. was yeah wow well you yeah. know and even moths if you look at them pattern moth wing patterns they have eyes they do mm -hmm. they right sure do yep how about wow. that wow about that? Well, look, we're really proud that you survived yeah. that. Yeah, me wow. too. We were, our jaws were hanging while you were telling that yeah, story. So, yeah, yeah, um, so I've had a couple of close calls on various things in my life. But one thing I can assure you after hearing that, you're still here for a reason. Yeah, I hope you, you find it. Because oh, yeah. That could have gone the other way easily. And yeah, if he'd caught her leg a little yep. better, yep. you know, there's no yep. telling. Yeah, and there's all kind of bacteria that could have got underneath yeah. their skin. Because no, yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. Not to mention I, bit. I'm just impressed, <laughs> but we look. We need you to. We, you need to get you a pistol. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. And good luck the rest of the hunting season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And what what advice might you have? So you did such a wonderful job keeping your composure. Uh, a a I mean, lot of people could not have what. So now that you've been through this, what advice would you give other people about if you're in this situation? Do this and don't do that. Well, definitely educate yourself. Um, so for me and my group of friends and stuff that we go out and shed hunt and hunt, we've watched videos. Like even when I started hunting, I didn't know what to do if I ever encountered a mountain lion. So educate yourself. Um, you know, like there's, there's, I'm sure there's like websites and you can go on there. What happens if you encounter a mountain lion and what to do and what not to do. And I've watched those videos a lot. And so I knew, you know, like not to turn my back stay calm not to run stuff like that so also it's you're in their country so just always be prepared you're not out there alone um you know carry carry a gun a knife bear spray and just be aware of your surroundings i just gotta sure. i just gotta be able to run faster than laney that's mm -hmm. that's the only thing <laughs> That's why you put on your tennis shoes, Bob. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And, and can you tell your – do you want to tell your Instagram handle so people can watch this video? Yeah, of course. So let me go to it to make sure I get it right. <laughs> so my Instagram is Shed Adventures, so like adventures but with shed in the front of it, underscore 15. Okay. Well, I hope a lot of people go follow you and – it looks like yeah, uh, it looks like you really enjoy it. You're like you're a serious hunter, and that uh, that impressed us. Yeah, I would say I am. It's well, my passion. So. All right. Well, gr well, good deal. Well, look. Well, thank you so much. We took time out of your day, but I appreciate you being on here. We all do. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Y'all have to watch thank this you. video. This is crazy. I saw it. Uh, I looked it up while we're, she was yeah. talking. I yep. found it. Nobody asked her if she's seen any turkeys or anything up there but nobody's I was, I was who, who wants to go who wants to go in that zone yeah. this, this has been a fascinating uh if, i don't i don't Always know is. yeah we'd love having you come yeah, over yeah, here man. bronson and appreciate you driving i like all the him way. asking questions that was good he's yeah, good that at was it. Fantastic. That was really good can you imagine being a student and having this guy as your teacher i'd actually show up to class i think i would too. <laughs> I mean, come on and look it's not a burden for him he can get to he can get here quicker than he can get to the Walmart and start for just about. So That's right. It's, it's an easy – I mean, we're just like a suburb of MSU right here. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Which well, good. means, Bobby, we should have him over here deer hunting more often. Yeah, we should. So but you need to – We take, should do that. But dry never dry gulch. It, have we never taken Bronson deer hunting? Though? No, and we could let him wear the horns. What in the world? we got to fix that. Yeah. It's Done. a problem Done. that needs to Put be it on the calendar. There you go. I'm the wrong. We're going to the Ponderosa. <laughs> hey, I'm, the, I'm the wrong person to remember anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we'll do I'll that. write it down. We'll yeah, do Bobby that. Not that I'll remember it. Yeah, we'd love to take you, Bronson. That'd be, be a lot a blast. of fun. So, yeah. all right, guys. Well, look, I, we appreciate everybody listening to the podcast. And don't forget uh, our television show on Tuesday nights on the Outdoor Channel, the Gamekeepers Television Show. We've been having Mike Chamberlain on uh, for like three in a row. We've, mm -hmm. yeah, we've yeah. really been preaching about turkeys. Mm -hmm. So when this airs, we will be almost to the emotional New Year for hunting. Well, oh, we'll be there. That's right. Gosh. We'll be half a week away. 
So that week prior to Labor Day is like magic. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's going back, it's like the, it got instilled in me as a little kid. You know, it's time to start again. You know, we're going dove hunting, squirrels are next, deer, bow, everything starts. And so the, and the, the wait and the dread of <laughs> summer, having to wait four or five months to get we back. We put our first round of peanuts yeah. in the pot last night. Wow. So. You know, That's when cool. you're boiling peanuts, it's about to be that time of year. Time. Yep. Manny, yep. have you got to go to the restroom or what? No, no. I mean, I thought you, you always do. asked me you what I learned. Qu- you got a question? No, you usually ask me what I learned. Did, well, but what did you learn? I was just going to – I actually had something I was going to say. <laughs> For once. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, just, just in Toxie, you've said this a thousand times. It reinforces it from what Bronson said today. You cannot plan enough. You just can't. You know, no, especially down you can't plant too much, that's for yeah, sure. you can't plant too much. So Mm-mm. you got a little space, scratch it up, get some seed going out there. Um, make it happen. Soil test and fertilize. Soil test and fertilize, yeah. that's right. Cannot plant enough. Yeah. Yep. That is true or works. And call your deer processor and get him ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For speed some, some great protein. All right, guys. Well, this has been interesting. Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mr. Alaska. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.